Hi freelancer, welcome to today's episode of the Freelance Blueprint. I'm your host Lizzie, a freelance UX designer and digital nomad. Today we're joined by Alejo, an illustrator who specializes in sketchnotes. The first time I came across his work was because of Christo when he shared a sketchnote Alejo made of one of his lessons. That was also the first time I came across sketchnotes in general and I've enjoyed following Alejo ever since. So I'm very excited to talk about his journey today. A little caveat, the Freelance Blueprint is a podcast for freelancers by freelancers. I'm interviewing other freelancers from all over the world with the mission to give you insights and learnings from people with different backgrounds and mindsets so you can make the best decisions for your own freelance career. And normally each episode is supposed to be about the guests of the podcast, but today's episode was probably more like an homage for Christo and the knowledge he so generously shares with other creators and freelancers so we can all be more successful. All right, so let's dive in. Hi Alejo, where are you calling from? Hi, I'm calling from Atlanta, Georgia. Nice. And if I wouldn't know anything about you, but I wouldn't meet your kid, how would they describe you to me? Oh, that's a cool question. He would say (laughs) um, that I am fun, that I cook. I don't know if he would describe how good I cook because he's a picky eater sometimes. (laughs) He would say that I work a lot and I work a lot. But he would also say that I'm fun to be around. So you're doing illustrations, you're doing sketch notes, you do social media, you're a dad, <laughs> you have a <laughs> newsletter, and you travel for work to conferences. How do you manage all of this? And how do you maintain an income while also having all of these, all of these things to do? Yeah, that's a good question. It's funny because you you started with like, what would your son say about you? And like one of the things that he definitely says is like that I work too much and I don't work that much, but I work from home a lot. And just the fact that he is at home and he's like, I want to play with you right now. It's like there's times when I'm working. I know that's why he will say like he works too much because he's not playing with me at this point. But um, anyway, that is to say like I actually try to work less than 30 hours a week and I like measure my time to make sure that I'm doing that. And part of the reason why I can do that is that I have, have certain kinds of work that is recurrent that thankfully kind of like pays the bills. And then with new work that comes, I become very efficient with my work. The nature of my work allows me to do that. And I, the value that it brings is also so good that I I have leveraged higher prices. So I don't need that many gigs a month to be stable and to have my bases covered. That is a good thing, you know, at this point in my life. Yeah, if I had gigs every week, you know, and have multiple gigs every week, I'll be making, you know, I don't know, like $200,000, $300,000 a a year. That'd be fantastic, right? But I wouldn't have time to be with my family and that wouldn't be that fantastic. So there's something that I, there's some compromise that I have to give and I'm happy to do it. And just for the sake of being around more, I don't travel <clears throat> like more than twice a month unless it's a tight month and I have to, and there just happens to be an event, but there are many events that are remote and there's many of my work that is also like not necessarily live sketch notes, but people who would send me text like, you know, a minute or a summary of something and then I'll translate that visually. So those things allow me to be at home and not travel that much, which is a great thing. Uh, The newsletter thing, it's a weekly thing. And right now, if you want to subscribe, it's called Fresh Ideas. And you can find it on my Instagram. If you click on the little link, uh, there's a link there that says subscribe to my newsletter. And I send weekly tips for uh, creative professionals to get better at business, things about mindset um, and stories. I'm trying to involve more storytelling into what I do instead of just telling you, hey, these are the four things that you should do to improve your business. But like telling a story of my life or a story that I've learned and attach that to a lesson because I believe in the power of storytelling. And um, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm doing right now. Part of the things of like social media have so much content that I just kind of like schedule it to just go there. The hardest part is to write the captions because I want to, mm-hmm. I don't want to just like post something and be like, here's what I did. Like the other day I was exploring Cara, like the new app that is like the, a lot of illustrators are moving from Instagram to there. Mm-hmm. I was like, what's the deal about it? 
And I was like, well, there's a lot of good art, but there's just people kind of like saying, I did this thing and this is an exercise that I did. It was like, so what? Like, it's like, it's cool, but so what? Like, what is the value they're giving me besides that? And I always like to share something and then share an idea in the caption that is relevant to that. So that's what takes me a little bit more time. But part of that and part of the reasons on my newsletter is because I eventually, in the podcast interviews that I have like this, is because I eventually would love to be a speaker at conferences and, you know, share all these things about my story, tips that I've learned with um, with other people you know, more audiences. Um, so that's part of my way of training myself in public speaking and developing my ideas, uh, developing something that is consistent that can teach other people and be useful. So uh, if you follow my path there, then maybe one day you'll see me at a conference and be like, yeah, I remember with that guy was just writing his newsletters. <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> I'd love to. Like if you're ever at yeah. the conference, I mean, I don't know. I assume it will be more american side of the world but i would love to come so i'm open because if it's in europe or anything like that i bring my family like <laughs> yeah in a second i'll do it yeah it's, it's part of the contract <laughs> they have to come with me so you're an illustrator i assume most people mm -hmm. know what that is but you specifically do sketch notes so for anyone who doesn't really know what that means can you explain it a little bit yeah happy to so sketch notes is one term that encompass a lot of other words like graphic recording, scribing, live illustration, visual notes. All of that is essentially uh, a way of capturing notes in real time that is visual. So for conferences or meetings, when people are discussing big ideas, what a sketch noter like me or a graphic recorder does is that they attend in real time and write and draw in real time, those ideas in a way that is compelling, that is fun, that is engaging, and that people actually look forward to seeing instead of just like a minute, you know, just text, 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 something that adds storytelling to it and that adds layers of emotion and meaning so that it makes it more memorable. Yeah, I also think people are generally more visual than like when you see a text, you don't really remember it. And even if you would remember something based off text, it's often the story. Because if you read a good book, for example, you can visualize what the story is or what the people in the book look like. Um, how did you get into the whole sketch note scene? Yeah, that was, I blame it on Instagram, <laughs> to be honest. Well, as an illustrator, I've always drawn my whole life. I've always loved it because I come from a family that was very prone to arts. I have a lot of aunts and uncles that are artistically inclined. My dad was a classic guitarist. So there was always an encouragement towards the arts. And when I went to college, I freaked out a little bit because in Costa Rica, the market for the arts is very small and I didn't want to be a starving artist. So I went to biology <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized that calculus and chemistry didn't go along with me very well, even though I appreciate them and I'm curious about them. And I ended up moving to graphic design because it was the closest to drawing that I could get without being like an artist, artist, you know, like everybody needs a logo, everybody needs branding. And that was my perception there. But then working on graphic design, I realized you know, I don't kind of dig it. <laughs> like I understand it. I appreciate it, but it's not my cup of tea. And what I love to do is drawing. So I decided to get out of the country, go and do a master's degree in the United States. And that was an illustration. And then I was like, okay, this is, this is my, my, my pot of land. I'm going to make a career, join pictures for books and newspapers. And well, after I graduated and I was working out, you know, how to do all that stuff, one of those days that you have just too much time on your hands, I was flipping out on my phone, uh, going on Instagram rabbit holes, and I found somebody who did graphic recording. I was like, well, this is interesting. You know, somebody is being paid to draw, to travel, to attend conferences, 
all of those three things I like. <laughs> so how, how can I learn that and how do I do that? And I've been taking notes and adding drawings to my notes my whole life. Like when I got bored or, you know, I had thoughts and doing journaling and all that stuff. So I was like, this is something that I think I could do and I could do well if I get the training. And yeah, so that's how it started. That was 2000, 2017. Uh, in 2018, I applied for a company uh, called the Sketch Effect, and they trained me, and that's where my journey like really took off. Uh, and I decided to not look back on graphic design or illustration as like editorial illustration, but just like focus completely on sketch notes. And yeah, it's been wonderful ever since. Nice. I guess nowadays with social media, there are so many jobs that we don't even know exist. Like, for example, you just coming across this video on Instagram, it's like, oh, someone can get paid for all the things that I'm good at and enjoy doing. So I could do the same. And there are so many things that will change as well, especially now with AI. The jobs we have today won't exist in a couple of years or maybe even months. And I mean, I remember when I was a kid and I found out that there are people who get paid to review hotels. They go there to stay in hotels. Um taste the food, judge the service. So how did you then, when you found that um, first job, how did you feel once you achieved that? Well, at the beginning, it was super exciting because I had found out something that I was good at and that I, that I had put myself into intentionally without knowing what would happen. Part of me felt excited. The other part of me had... It was not imposter syndrome. It was a sort of guilt because I had spending all this time and money, you know, going to college for a specific kind of illustration, right? And wrap my myself in the or my head into the idea that I was going to be a certain kind of artist uh, that took his time doing illustration, like. I used to spend days or weeks doing one illustration because I would do multiple compositions and all that. And I feel like that's a lot of training. You know, that's a lot of effort. That's a lot of time, a lot of all nighters. And now I was doing doodles, right? And I'm, I, sketches are not doodles, are more than that. And there's a lot of different skills that you need to have in order to do it effectively but part of me felt guilt because i was just deviating it's like what is people from college gonna say turns out they actually are proud because i actually managed to go to my you know college earlier this year they hired me <laughs> to <laughs> wow. to do this at, at a meeting that they have and they were all fascinated by it and my old illustrator illustration professors were like this is awesome like this is so cool i could never do those things it's like these people that i looked up to and, um, you know, gave me all this perspective of the industry. And now I'm like doing this new thing. So that was actually a, a kind, a nice full circle to realize that I took the right decision on focusing on this aspect. And since then, it's just been really cool. I've, I've learned a lot because it's not only the skill that you learn, but also the spaces that you have access to now because of that. Many artists, they just work from home, right? Like they send the brief, you have the information, you do the thing, you send it and that's it. But in my line of work, I have to go where the client is, whether it's like virtual, but many times it's like on site. And I get to hear conversations that other people don't have access to, much less artists, right? People who are changing the world in their different uh, spheres of influence and one of the things that has been more reassuring is that I have perceived from all these hundreds of events that I've attended, the majority of people are trying to do good in the world. And that is very reassuring, right? Because we, we see like greedy corporations and all that. And I've worked with big corporations and inside those corporations, they're humans who are trying to do good in the world, who are like doing their best to do things right and to help people, you know, not they're just, just thinking about profit. So some of those things have been like help expand my my perspective uh, increase my knowledge and just kind of what's the word like feel yeah feel reassured feel excited feel happy about the fact that we humans are trying to do it right you know we, we mess it up because we're humans but everybody's trying to do things right and 
I think that just reestablishes hope. In humanity. It's good that you point this out because I think so many people, especially nowadays with what's happening, I think we all know things are going downhill. Um, in America, women lose a lot of rights. Um, but there's a lot of war happening. Maybe it's just as much as there was before, but now you just are more aware of it and you're constantly bombarded. And the guilt that you mentioned, you feel guilty for, like, I feel guilty that I can travel the world. I can still earn money. I can still have fun why other people are in this prison and they cannot escape their country and they cannot just go or they have to go to military, like all these kind of things. So it's nice mm. to hear some positive news as well that people generally want to do good things. Was there one specific thing that you remember where you're like, oh my God, I didn't expect this and this is actually amazing? Yeah, well, I mean, like super amazing, no, but it was it just changed my perspective because I, I had to attend an event that had to do with mining. And we all know that mining is very harmful to the environment. And as I was listening to these people who were talking about how they extract different materials and how they, they have to deal with different, you know, like laws that they have to abide to and different processes and different technologies and all that. After the first few sessions, my, my brain was a little bit like, Ugh, because there was a lot of laws that were being talking about, not, not like big ideas, but laws. And that's very challenging to do with graphic recording. So after that, there was a break and I got out of the room and I saw one of the guys, you know, who had like spoken and I decided to just like sit next to him. I was like, hey, what are you working on? Like, can I sit? Can we talk? And he started talking to me about, you know, what got him into this industry and what he was so passionate about it one of the things that he said is like people what the people don't understand is like there's some people who are trying to go all completely renewable sources and there's some people who try to go no like let's not do renewable sources blah blah, blah. and the thing is like at this point in time it's not healthy to do either or like if we could continue with just fuel fossils we'll destroy the world but if we move completely to renewable sources we don't have the capacity with the renewable sources that we have right now to to satisfy the demand of things that are happening and like imagine it there's going to be hospitals that may not have electricity because of this or stuff like that so he was mentioned he was talking to me about how for example gas was one thing that used to be very um destructive like they will have to dig this whole you know um this big hole and like carve and there will be like resources that will escape and all that and it was very uh wasteful but now they have developed a technology that was essentially kind of like a thing that kind of like when they they make what is it called like the, that camera that they put on your stomach to like uh, see yeah. your insides so it's like a thing that just goes through the cracks and goes through the holes and all that so they don't have to dig a hole even to find the sources of the gas and they can just extract it from there so it's less invasive so i was like i didn't know that nobody talks about that but people are saying no gas is destructive and all that well it's not as much anymore what that showed me was essentially like the information that we got is bias you know we don't know a lot unless we are in the places where people are managing the information sometimes but then also these people who are even working in these industries have a concern about saving our planet um, and i feel like for the most part if these people were not there doing that then we're probably already extinguished <laughs> <laughs> you know so i guess seeing it in that under that light is like it shows that there's still kind of like a struggle there's a push towards helping the environment you know it's not as much as maybe most people would want but it's still there and it's helping us kind of stay a little bit behind that dangerous cliff you know so that's one conversation that i remember very vividly yeah, yeah. i think there's a lot of things that we get one side of the story like for example the whole palm oil stuff like, don't use palm oil don't use products with palm oil And then someone told me that actually palm oil is one of the most efficient oils to get if you look at land. So if you have, I don't know, 10 hectares of palm oil, you produce more than if you'd have the same area and use, I don't know, olive oil or rapeseed, whatever mm. else it is. So actually, environmentally, it's one of the best oils. The problem is mm. not the oil, it's the deforestation. Mm. So it's things like that. When you learn that, it's like, ah, I mean, I need to double check that fact because before I publish this, but <laughs> It's things like this where we think it's extremely bad, but that's also why it's good to have social media, why there's so much information out there. Or when you think of freelancing, there are so many tips now that are so accessible for everyone that before it would be so hard to find. Um, 
How do you feel about giving away information or were there any tips online that were were useful for you when you started your career? Yeah, well, when I started my career, I guess in, in illustration in general, I wasn't very much online, I guess. Um, you know, like it was kind of the beginnings and I think I was still at that stage in which I was more relying on finding mentors and tutors and people that I knew that had expertise in certain things. And I had a mentor that I reached out because I was curious about investing. I have never heard of it. And then the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, was on on the table, you know, in my house. And I was like, oh, let's read it. So that guy helped me out to develop kind of like a an idea of planning life and where to invest your efforts to get a good return, like not only to invest your money, but to invest your time, your energy, um, your knowledge. And so I guess like online, it was it was probably after I came here to the US, like 2014, that, you know, most of my people, <laughs> my friends and family were away, but I started relying more on things online and finding information, learning things for myself because I was not close to anybody who knew things that I needed. And at that point, it was 2014. It's kind of funny how things kind of align because it was exactly on that time when I saw a video by Chris Doe uh, that he was explaining how to charge for a logo, like and, and the difference between value pricing and hourly pricing and where hourly, pr hourly pricing was not right or not smart, I guess. I feel like it was that point and that whole context of me being in a new place with the purpose of learning complete, like just learning and getting the most out of the experience, growing professionally, like, you know, flying out of the nest and being like, okay, there's this thing called internet. There's this thing called social media. I can use it to learn. I can use it to, to prone me, to, to fuel me. And that I started being more geeky about learning all that sort of stuff. And I don't know, there's been so much because, you know, since 2015, I've been following Christo, you know, and, and his path and all the things that he has uh, taught in the future. And then I also uh, found out about Donald Miller and he was starting with the, uh, the story brand framework things. And I feel like those two kind of influences have been helping me along the path of uh, growing as a professional. And I cannot pinpoint one single lesson that I've like specifically searched, but I feel like throughout my path and the way that I've approached life as a professional, there's one thing that has been kind of like a general trend. And this actually circles back to my mentor in Costa Rica. When um, the last time that we met before, I took that plane and came here. We had a conversation and he was like, I just want to, you know, talk one last time with you. We're going to keep in touch, but, you know, we're not going to be meeting and all that. And I want to tell you something like, um, well, he asked me how I was feeling. I was geeking out and, you know, and then he said, I'm very happy for you. I'm very happy for you. You, you have this great opportunity and you'll be very tempted to feel like you're going there to just learn things and get things in your own backpack, you know, on your own utility belt. But remember this, <clears throat> you might be even going there. And he used this, he's, he's a man of faith, so he used these words. Yes, you might be even going there to be the answer to somebody else's prayer. The, the things that you have learned here in your story, you know, in your life, by being involved in the things that you have involved in leadership and helping youth and all that stuff, those things are unique to you. And some people out there have never known that and they would only know it through you. So you have something to give, your perspective, your experience, your heart. So remember this, even though you're going there to learn, you can go there and leave whatever you are better than how you encounter it. And when he said that, it kind of like shocked me a little bit, but at the same time, it it reinforced something in me, which is, hey, I don't need to prove myself. I have value already. And being able to 
show up knowing that you have value put you, puts you in a very good position because not only imposter syndrome is gone, right? Or maybe lurking, but not so loud. But then you have the opportunity to actually enjoy sharing what you know and being generous with what you know that opens up so many doors that they wouldn't otherwise open if you're just there to learn and to stay in the background in the receiving end. So every time that I go to a new place, especially in a, in a place where I know that I'm probably the one who is the least experienced in general terms, like I'm going to a conference in a few weeks where there's people who make millions of dollars, right? Like there's a way ahead of me in bus business wise, you know, it feels a little bit intimidating. It feels like maybe I'd be a little bit inadequate to be there, but I know that I have my own value that none of them can give because they're not me. So I go there with the intention of like just giving the best of me, right? Of course, learning from everybody, but giving the best of me. And I've, I've named this thing just kind of voluntary generosity, like feeling that you have something of value and because you know that you have something of value, then giving it away freely is one of the best things that you could do with your life is is not only like an action but it's like a way of living and i will say it's even like an identity because if you identify it as a generous person that just you know spreads to every area of your life and as a freelancer or you know a biz small business owner or creative professional in my case that happens to translate in good business because when you're generous with your knowledge, when you get on a client call and you're not looking to just close the call, but you're looking to help and you're being generous with your time, with your questions, with your advice, you're guiding the client to the best outcome that translates in better business because that creates trust. When you show up online, you know, on social media and, and you give advice to other creatives, when you show your process and you, and you give all those things out of your pure generosity, that translate again in more trust, more people seeing, more people believing in you, more people interested in what you do, more conversations happening uh, because everybody wants to be around somebody who is generous, right? Like nobody wants to be around people who are stingy and like trying to get things from you. Uh, everybody wants to be around others who give. So yeah, that has been one thing that is like, not that I learn online per se, but that has been something that online has translated well for me as well. And it's the perspective that I use when I approach social media. I think it's a really nice lesson that your mentor or your professor gave you because that's something that he gave you that mindset shift and you take it with you. Like what you mentioned with the backpack, you might go there with an empty backpack, but you already have presents inside that you can just give to anyone who you're meeting. And All of them have presence. And also what you said before that maybe you feel inadequate to go to that conference. I mean, just the fact that you're invited to go there, it doesn't mean that, like, I mean, that proves already that you are. And I also think I actually had a discussion about the confidence stuff on the previous podcast episode about how some freelancers are very confident or maybe they just overplay it and others all of them struggle with imposter syndrome. Like everyone feels like I'm not good enough. I should know more about this. But then all of us have something we can teach and it's a back and forth. And I also think like the more you give, the more you get back. And it's also what you yeah. mentioned, like if you wouldn't have seen Christo's real post, whatever it was, 2015, you've been following this person for almost 10 years now. Like it's actually mad. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> If you would not have seen that, you know, maybe you would not like you'd still be stuck with hourly pricing and yeah, not have gotten the amount of money that you've managed to get by now um, over those 10 years. It's also funny that you mentioned Christo because I'm always thinking about how did I actually come across that person that I'm interviewing? And it was Christo. It was a while ago. I think he shared one of your sketch notes you've done on, I don't know if it was a talk or something like that. Um, but then I really liked that idea. I've never came across, come across sketch notes before. And then I started following you. And then, um, I think it was like earlier this year, it's been a couple of months ago, there was this Instagram live and it was with Christo and Carlos and they had this, uh, sales role play and they just spontaneously invited someone from the audience to join. And 
you can imagine an Instagram live with Christo, how many people request to be this one person. And then I remember he said this when he was trying to pick a person to do the role play with. And he was like, oh, I actually know this guy. And you popped on. And I was like, oh, I know this guy. It's the sketch guy, you know. <laughs> and then you had this role play. And it was so, it was so, um, it was like such a nice Saturday. Like for me, it was Saturday morning um, activity mm -hmm. because it was like watching a movie. It was like the good and the bad person, the good person trying to like sell without being like salesy. And it was such a great life. Can you tell people how, or can you give tips to anyone who might want to get noticed by someone like Christo, because in the freelance world, I guess for many um, creators in general, he's such a guru. Like, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't like this, but like people know him. Everyone has a lot of respect for him. <laughs> yeah. Um, he has a certain authority. So getting noticed and being remembered by Christo, how, yeah, how did this happen? How did you do it? Yeah, that was, that was quite a, an interesting experience to me too. Um, Things started to happen, I think, because there are some things that I believe I, I have on my favor. It is like the kind of drawing that I do sometimes relies on things that, I mean, okay, let's start from the beginning. I knew Chris Doe already has an appreciation for sketch notes um, because I've seen uh, people that he has supported before. And I also have, we have a friend in common that is a guy that I, admired but we have become very close friends that he does sketch notes too and i have heard him before on a podcast with chris because he used to be in the in the pro group too so like we have kind of like a friend in common that just happens to be something that happened there but you know my friend didn't introduce me to chris i didn't ask him to introduce me to chris it's just like one time i showed up to one of these conversations and what i did is that i sketch note the conversation I, it was actually last year and I had just started doing my own business. I had, uh, you know, exited my full-time job and dedicated on this like completely. And I had a mentor, a coach that I hired at the time. And she suggested that I would do, I needed to form a portfolio that was my own. And one of the best ways was to probably get podcasts or, you know, live webinars or stuff like that of people that I've, enjoyed you know their content that i was appreciative of the things that they I have learned from them and as a way of like thank them create a sketch note of it and then send it to them and see what happened and if they saw it you know by grace of god <laughs> you know and define you know a stars align and all that and they share it that would be great if they didn't then that's fine you still have your own portfolio you have things that you can share online to prove what you do. And um, I decided to start joining live webinars and doing the sketch notes and share them before the webinar was finished. Because if I share them after the webinar was finished, they might've get busy doing something else. They might get distracted. But while the conversation is happening, if, you, if I share it, you know, people will be like, wait, are you, are you doing this right now? Like, did you just Dude, like, did, did he tell you, like, this was a conversation. There's no way you could have known what they were going to talk about. So they started to get the bus. And so I did that for Chris and he saw it and he shared it. He got a lot of, you know, views and engagement and all that. So he messaged me. He's like, hey, great job on that. Like, it's getting a lot of traction. And I was like, thank you. I appreciate it. Like, and what I said at that point is like, I, I wanted to. I wanted to have a sort of connection with him in which he could know me personally. I didn't know if I was going to work for him or not. Like I, that was not on my radar because for me it was like, I don't care if he pays me or not. I'll still do them for him because all the things that I've learned from him, I feel like I actually owe him money. So, <laughs> so, so, so it was my way of kind of paying him back, you know, uh, that reciprocity effect. And what it is like, hey, I would love to give it to you, like to just send you a print if that's cool, you know, with you, if you have space in your wall. <laughs> so I asked him if there was an address that I could send him to. And, and he said, yes. Yeah. So I sent him a note, a handwritten note, made a drawing of him. I sent him the print and all that. And, you know, with all that, uh, he started to know me a little bit more as a person and started following me and started watching my videos. So I feel like at that point when I was in his radar, 
it was it was just a good way of kind of connecting um he did ask me eventually like if i'd be up for certain you know for certain things um and i'll be just like they're like hey i want to i want to help you out you know like let's do it like let me know when there's the new event because i will join for sure and do a sketch note if, if um if if that's you know if that works out so um so yeah i've been part of it has been like i know he has appreciation of sketch notes so we worked out if i reach out to somebody else which i've reached out to other people who have no appreciation of sketch notes or it's not in the radar or it's not the thing that they kind of like know this situation wouldn't have happened you know like i've i've done sketch notes for many many people and like three of them have like reached back kind of like this is awesome you know and continue the conversation and and even like a relationship there so you know it's not like everybody will resonate necessarily it just happens to be that way for me um but i also you know i i really vibe with his energy with the way that he behaves and the way that he treats people just his his way of, of coaching also is something that i that i crave um so I feel like if I can add value to his life, then that's great. And if he allows me to be in that space, then I'm just going to show up and take it like with gratitude. Um, and I remember one thing because I've been following him for so long that he has mentioned that one of the things that he, that annoys him, <laughs> I think he used this word that annoys him is people who are, he used this term too smart for their own good. And I was like, what does he mean? And what he said is like, there's people who will ask you for advice. And when you tell them the advice, they'll be like, uh, well, but I don't know. And like overthinking it, they don't do it. And it's like, why did you ask me for my advice if you're not going to do anything with it? So I realized, man, that's, that makes a lot of sense. And so when we were in this conversation on LinkedIn, when he told me like, hey, do this thing. I'll go like, yes, sir. And I'll go and do it. Like, and, and my, my thing is like bias towards action. Like I, I'm not overthinking. Like he tells me to do a, and I'm just going to do a, and then report back. This is what happens. And if it didn't work, you know, I'm not going to be like, oh, but you told me blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, he can tell me like, what else can you try? Um, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to question. I'm just going to go and do it because I am assuming that he has so much more experience than me that I better just go and try it. I have nothing to lose with that. And I feel like that caught his eye, that caught his, his attention. Like this person not only does good work, not only is, you know, in general terms, I'm a nice person, right? I'm not, I'm not greedy or I'm not like trying to take advantage of people or anything like that. And he also is biased towards action. He takes my advice and do it. So I think that he has realized that he can give me advice safely because he knows I will take it. And that is good advice invested, right? So I, I try to just kind of approach that when I have a situation in which I want to kind of be in the, in the, what is it called? In the, in the radar of people who have maybe more, you know, experience, more following, or I don't know, more power maybe uh, than me, then I want to make sure that the impression that I cause on them is not only correct, you know, accurate, but also that it's a good one, that it, that they feel that they're not going to waste their time with me, right? Yeah. I know their time is limited. So whatever they tell me, whatever they ask, you know, request of me, um, I want them to know that it's going to be well invested. And so I guess that's going to be, that's that has been one of those things that has worked out, you know, well for now. I'm looking forward to meeting him actually in, in a few weeks. Oh, nice. Uh, that's going to, that's going to be great. Um, and I'm just, just so grateful that that has worked out so far. Wow. So Nice. I think like what you said with the giving advice and just doing it, it's easy if it's from Christo, like you've seen all the results he's done for other people. I know it's easy to follow that. Um, I've also had coaching and then sometimes they give you a certain advice and it just feels like it's not me. Like actually, um, I don't know if you know, I was on the other live, the other sales call. Yeah. So the week after I, I just chatted with Carlos because he plucked, of course, uh, his uh -huh. sales, um, his newsletter. And then I noticed some things in the user journey and I just asked him, do you want feedback? And said, yes. And then he was like, oh, by the way, we want to do another role play. Do you want to get on? It's like, 
oh my god i'm gonna be on a live request oh my god does this is this real you know and yeah was nervous for a whole week and then yeah i kind of ruined it because it didn't give away my rates during the live call and it was mm. because of my coach like he told me don't say the price until they have no more hesitations resolve all the other hesitations because the price is usually the biggest um barrier um so I just didn't say my price. And then in the end, Crystal was actually like, yeah, um, just say the price. There's nothing wrong with saying your rate, you know? And looking back, I know that now, but still, because I listened to advice of someone else and like in the end, he saw the life as well. And he was like, yeah, I feel a bit bad. <laughs> it's like, I was still the one who listened to it, you know? And then there's other yeah. things where, oh, if you want to sell, just DM people. And it's like, but I don't want to DM to sell. Like, I reach out to some of the followers because especially when they engage a lot, I'm just like, why are you interested in me? You know, but yeah. it don't want to start a conversation because I want to sell. How do you like, is it specifically with Chris Lowe though like this where you just, whatever he says, I'll do it because I trust him. Or did you ever face a situation where you listen to someone else's advice and then, yeah, maybe it didn't go so well. Yeah. That's a good question. I mean, advice doesn't always work. And, and that's the reality of it for, for many reasons. Like it could be the, the best advice in the world and maybe your, your specific situation or like, I don't know, something happened that day that deviated the attention of people. Like, uh, like there's multiple factors. The, I think the idea of advice is not necessarily that it works or not. It's the fact that you're trying and testing and that testing is giving you the experience to know what works for you. So I typically apply the advice of things that I haven't done yet, right? Like if I have done something already, it's like, okay, I'm doing it. Like I don't need to kind of like follow it again because I'm already trying it. But if it's something that I haven't tried yet, then my gut reaction is like, okay, let's do it and see what happens. So when Chris tells me this thing, it's like, okay, there's people who have, like Chris that has seen, has given advice to multiple people and has seen patterns of growth in multiple people that are, you know, in his case, creatives, like in a similar industry than me. So if he has seen what works, I don't, I don't want to spend my days and nights trying to figure out by myself how to create warm water if somebody already made it and knows how to make it. So it doesn't really make sense for me to overthink it, right? I just like, just do, just do it. There are certain scenarios where maybe it may be hard to apply certain things. And that's where I will ask questions to be like, hey, you know, this is my situation right now. I don't know if that would apply to me. Like I was talking recently with, I'm very interested in, into getting at some point into like, like real estate, but like buying uh, places to to make like Airbnbs or like rentals and stuff like that. I don't have the capital right now to do it, but I'm always learning. And I got into conversations with a few people on Instagram who do these things. And, you know, they were, they were telling me like, hey, you know, you could do this thing, this thing. So like what I ask is like, yeah, but like what is the minimum that I should have saved so that this makes sense. So they said like, yeah, you'll need like at least like $10,000, you know, or talk me back when you have $10,000 ready to, to apply. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's great. Because if I just go right now, it would be suicide. Probably it would be too risky. Um, and I don't want to put my family in that sort of a risk right now. So that sort of thing is like, okay, if I, if I feel like there's some piece missing and that might not work out because I don't have certain thing, I will ask. And then if they tell me just like, try it out. Okay. I'll try it out. Of course. It's not like, like if Chris told me, Hey, you should go and jump out a bridge. It's like, well, no, because that doesn't make sense. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so it's don't. not like, <laughs> it's not like blind faith necessarily, but I also, from the things that I've learned from following Chris for so long and hearing his conversations and being in contact with people who know him, I've realized that he's not going to advise me anything that is going to put me into harm because when he gives advice it's because he cares so with that assumption i feel safe about taking advice right um it's not just taking advice from any stranger just because they're pros or whatever you know like i've listened to a lot of people out there but you know chris Doe and donald miller are the ones that i have a more rounded understanding of because i followed their paths for so long 
And I have seen what they talk about, not only in relationship to their business, you know, but also personally how they manage their families, their, their, their mindset, you know, their mental health and all that. So I feel more confident about taking advice from them. Um, I haven't taken advice from Donald Miller, but <laughs> maybe one day. Yet, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the word. Yes. Um, but yeah. What you said before about feeling like it's the same vibe, the same energy. I think that's so important, especially when you find a mentor or hire a coach, because sometimes people just do things differently. Or nowadays, everyone's a coach. Like I'm still ugh, imposter, you know, just that word is like, ugh, I feel so uncomfortable with it. Um, but in a way, I am a coach as well, you know, and it's this, I had it before where someone just tells me to do something and I'm like, it's just not me. It feels icky. It feels wrong. It's not that it's out of my comfort zone. Like I'm so used to doing things in my comfort zone nowadays. Like I'm opening a co-living. I've never run a hotel before, you know? And it's like, you know, I'm used to doing things out of my comfort zone. That's not the problem. It's more like if it doesn't feel like me or it, it doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. Any freelancer who's listening who might want to uh, find a mentor or um, um, hire a coach, what advice would you give them for when they choose someone? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the first one has to do with like a track record of doing things that are similar to you or being in an industry that is similar to you. That's that's the first one that is the, probably the easiest to verify. Like, you know, put the 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 topic of like the Airbnb for example. Like, if there's somebody who is selling a course or a cohort or coaching to like how to create Airbnbs, and I cannot find where like where their business is and how it's working. Like that's just a red flag there, and they might have expertise in another industry that is similar, but not necessarily Airbnb. So I'll still be kind of like, mm. you know, that's the first thing. I think the second one is like, anytime that you buy a service, you are not only buying the service, but you're, I'm gonna put this into quotes because it sounds kind of awful, but you're kind of like buying the person, right? Like you're, you're entering a relationship with somebody and every relationship, like not every relationship has the same vibe using the same word, right? And it's the same thing that you would do if you go to a doctor and the doctor doesn't, doesn't listen to you and just prescribes you with anything. It's like, I'm not going to keep going with that doctor. Like, I don't care if they're doctors and they're like super famous and have all their certificates. Like they just didn't listen to me. We don't vibe and I'm not going to feel safe with them. So with somebody that you're going to pay to help you with your business, if you're not going to feel safe to open up and talk about your business, then it's not going to work. You're going to waste your money. So you always have that first consultation in which you want to check the vibe, you know, too, and see if you resonate with the person. And I, I think that after that, it's just kind of seeing where it takes, like, you know, how, how good they are with giving the advice. Because one thing is they have done it and that's great. They have the track record. The second thing is they are in the same vibe with you and same frequency and, and you like them. That is great. And the third one is how good they are at teaching or coaching, which is a, a whole different skill. I've seen a lot of people who are good at doing the thing. They're not so good at advising others to do it or listening to others to kind of detect or um, diagnose what they should do. So if you take into account those three things and the three of them check, I think you have a solid way to take a decision and be like, yeah, I'm going to go towards this person i i've been i'm grateful and I'm, i've been lucky i guess that i haven't had to had so many i've had it had to interview so many people like typically the people that i get in the, in the first place tend to be good and so so I, I don't know maybe that's just maybe i've been lazy about it <laughs> and i've missed out because i haven't found better people but so far it has worked out for me sometimes it happens but sometimes you might have to go and do a little bit more of research um i guess the vive check you can actually see it if they're like very and they're reactive online if they have for example you have as a podcast they can hear your tone you know they can hear how you behave if they see it in video they can also see you know your your um your gestures and all your body language and all that. And that can give you a, a check of like, 
am I liking this person? Am I liking their vibe? Are they too hyper and they're going to get mistressed out? Are they too calm and I'm going to get bored and impatient with them? Like, or are they just, you know, measured and all that? Like all those things affect your decision. So seeing people on YouTube or on social media or your podcast and all that, that can give you a good idea yeah, to I, start with. I actually find it interesting that you called yourself lazy for not doing more research on coaches because <laughs> I feel like it's, it could also be efficient. I actually talked with someone recently about decision making and I'm this kind of person that I look at all the options. And even if I think, okay, 90%, this one is the right one, I will go with this. Then maybe someone just says something I'm like, ah, oh, ah, oh God, and I didn't consider this. And then I review everything. And then in the end, I'm not sure. And then I just do it by myself. And it's like, it would have been so mm. much easier to like all these kind of things. And it's interesting how we talk to ourselves because someone could just say it's efficient. You're just good at decision-making. It's like, okay, this person feels right. And also there is no perfect. So good enough is good. Mm -hmm. um, but have you had any like mindset shifts or things where when you notice that You've, since you've had that shift that you did something different, like, for example, you would not call yourself lazy now because actually it's efficient, for example. Um, uh. Were there any epiphanies that you've had based on what a coach has told you or a friend or some learnings when someone gave you a present from their backpack? Nice. I like that metaphor of the present from their backpack. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Well, the, definitely the first one would be that one that I shared with my mentor telling me like, And again, I, I don't want this to sound like I'm inflating myself, but I do see myself with value, right? Like I don't take that for granted. I'm, I'm willing to take space and to share what I think because I think it's value. And that comes from that. I think another one has been just, and I cannot pinpoint it to somebody specifically, but has been this whole idea of sales conversation is just trying to help other people, right? It's not about convincing anybody. Like when I found out that you don't have to convince, it's like, thank goodness. Because I've never been very good at convincing people. And I know now why, because people don't want to be convinced. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people want to know what they know and they want to be feel reaffirming what they know. And the most open people just want to know their options and just want to know, you know, what other things are out there, but they, they don't like, nobody likes somebody else to tell you how you should think. Right. So, in a sales conversation, just having that understanding of like, I'm trying to discover what these people think, what these people believe, what is important for them. And then try to point out, okay, if this is important, what do I have to give that can match that? And if I don't have it, I'm not going to offer it. Right. Like I, I don't have the thing that can solve your problem. Like if you have a headache, and I draw, like, I don't know how's that going to solve that. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to send you to the pharmacy, right? But if you have problem with communication and I draw, oh, look at that. I can help you there. You know, this is how I can help you. Um, I think that has been very relieving for me. And then, well, I f frequently also with sales, because I've been geeking out about sales, because it's one of the things that I needed more practice with. Because I actually I, think I you did a great job on that sales call. Like, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was it was fun. It was fun. But like sales is the thing that I need more more practice in just because I've had, you know, conversations with people, but I I used to just represent another company as an artist, but I was not the person who did the sales for that company. So I was just the artist. So I could talk about the value of what I do, but I wasn't as good as like, okay, when we gotta close the deal, like how does this work? So you know, since going freelance, I'll be just like narrowing my focus into that. And it's been a lot of fun. And one of the things that I, that I learned too, is like, there's people who have scripts and I've heard people that, that are trained, like you have half an hour, this is the points that you need to cover. These are the things that you need to do. And it's more like a pitch, right? And that makes me very nervous and gives me anxiety of all sorts, because again, I feel like it's convincing mode and You know, the, the coach that I have now, he says, like, just need to know three things. You know, like one of them is like, what's going to happen here? And you ask, how can I be of value so that you let them talk about what's the value that they see in your work, find out what their goals are, and then match it, talk about the price in ranges, and then see what they think about it, and then help them make a decision. 
But the main thing is like you want to do a conversation that ends on a yes or a no. Maybe it doesn't exist. It's a yes or a no. That's the hardest part that I'm still trying to figure out because there's people who are like, yeah, my boss is the one who's going to take the decision. It's like, okay. <laughs> so, um, but just having the, the conversation of like how to help somebody else with your services has been a good approach for sales. And um, one, one thing that I teach my son, I mean, he's five years old, but I try to tell him this and drill it into his brain as much as possible. And one day he wanted to buy something and I was like, where are your savings? Like you have some money. It's like, Oh, I left it at home. It's like, Oh, well, how can you, how can you make more money? It's like, I don't know. So I tell him all the time, like, if you want to make money, learn to be helpful. So learn to figure out where people have a need, you know, where they're struggling with something. And you can start like, you know, not that we're going to pay him for everything, but you can start by practicing like, Oh, did mama just said that she's thirsty. She has a problem there. How can you be helpful, right? <laughs> oh, did, did, did you hear Papa saying that he's he's tired and stressed out? You know, he has a problem there. How can you be helpful, right? So like, having that mentality of like, how can I be helpful to other people will help you eventually to be better at your business because business in general is just essentially solving somebody else's problem for money. That has been a good kind of, mindset that I've uh, that I've taken. It's so interesting what people are trying to pass on to their children because maybe it was a certain learning for you, this whole oh, sales cringiness. Okay, how can I make it easier for someone? I'm just going to teach them to be helpful so it will be natural to them. No matter if it's going to be for business purposes or general in life, it's always good to have a person that is helpful and it will also be beneficial for them because I generally feel whatever you give, you're going to get back. So if he's helpful to others, people will also help him in return. So it's a good thing to raise him with that. And yeah. I talked to my sister about this and I'm staying at her place at the moment and how our dad raised us around money because we're both quite, I mean, we all had our lessons. We learned things the hard way, but we're now, we're independent. No matter if we have a relationship or not, we don't need a partner. We don't need someone else to um, be able to do the things we want. And we got pocket money. And um, my boyfriend, he's in Sri Lanka, very, 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 very different culture. And his nephew went on a trip, 10 years old, and I gave him a bit of pocket money just to teach him how to use money because he's never had his own money. He's never had a wallet. It's like, here's your money. You can do whatever you want with it. You can save it. You can buy some sweets. You can buy a present for someone else. You can buy a souvenir for your mom. Whatever you want to do with it, do. And because he didn't have a wallet, he gave it to his grandmother. And then they came back from the trip. And I'm like, so what did you do with your pocket money? Oh, it's with grandma. He didn't do anything. Uh. <laughs> he didn't do anything. And it's interesting how like certain things that we get from our parents and it's such a gift and we don't realize that is it because my sister and I got pocket money, even if it's like 50 cents per week, you know, we learned to save up. I was saving up for mangas, you know? So it's like, okay, <laughs> I need five weeks and then I can buy a manga, you know? Um, <laughs> the other thing you mentioned was following the sales script. And I also noticed at the beginning of the podcast, I tried to stick to my questions, to um, stick to a script so that if the conversation goes a certain way, I, I still have the question to ask. Whereas now, maybe it's also because I've done a couple of podcasts, but now I just try to pull something out of some, what someone said. And if it's similar to a topic that we talked before or that's relevant for freelancing, I like to dig a bit deeper, but then also I'm like, okay, how do I get back to the freelance topic? Or <laughs> <laughs> So it's, it's all practice, but I enjoy the conversations way more, not having to stick to a script. Yeah, I, I've, I've felt the same way in just general conversations, especially when there's a group, like it's maybe easier if it's just like conversation between two people, but if there's a group and somebody starts talking about something and it's like, oh, that reminds me of something I want to share it, but I'm going to wait until they finish, but they continue and then change the idea and then continue and then change the idea. And then somebody else jumps in and was like, well, that's, that's that, you know, I, <laughs> I didn't share what I was going to share, but that's fine. I'm still present and I've old me would be like, no, but I need to share this, but I need to share this, you know? And I, I remember at some point, like being like, like, do I need to, like, do I need to share everything like at, at all the point? Or is it just important 
too, that I just listen to others and then let people just explain and let the conversation go. It's an organic thing, right? You just let it let it grow. It's, it's like a vine, you know? Yeah. You can kind of guide it, but it will do its own thing. So, yeah. I mean, that's why we have two ears and one mouth. So we listen more than we speak. That's That's what they yeah. say. And it's also a lot of people just don't feel heard. So if you can give someone that feeling that you're actively listening, you're not just listening to be able to speak over them, but you generally hear them, not just the words yeah. that come out, but you make the connection. It's such, it's just such a nice conversation and the feeling people leave with just because they feel heard. Like what you said before with the doctor, they're just not listening. It makes a big, big difference. Yeah, it does. There are three questions I ask all my podcast guests. And one of them is, would you ever go back to a permanent job? I don't think so. And, you know, I have nothing really against full-time jobs. It's just, I feel like the same way that some people like sushi and some people don't, I feel like full-time jobs are not my thing, um, especially because I have a family and having to commute or dedicate a specific amount of time and not have flexibility doesn't really work for me. Like on Sunday, I got food poisoning. And on Monday, if I had had a full-time job, I would have to take PTO, you know, that could have used on vacation or something like that. But I didn't have like, I just stay at home, right? Like I just napped. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's the sort of things that I, I want to have flexibility for, especially as my son grows and we start planning like more trips and stuff like that like i want to be able to have that flexibility nice. so yeah long 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 answer but yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay two more if you could go back in time to the person that let's say you finished your illustration degree and mm -hmm. you then realized oh actually it doesn't really pay the bills i'm not an artist artist where you didn't know exactly if this is going to pay your bills What would you today tell your past self? The first thing that comes to mind is just get out of the country, go study abroad. Um, and there's, again, there's nothing wrong with Costa Rica. It's a nice country, actually good education and very affordable compared to the United States. Uh, but because I grew up there, I was in a bubble in a market that was too small. And... I feel like I was too focused on other stuff and not so much on my professional development that I felt like I didn't feel that need of leaving the country until I had finished my undergrad and was like, okay, so what now? And I mean, I actually had an opportunity of going out of the country when I was in my senior year of high school. Um, I applied to a college, in, to a college that is kind of like a, you do senior year and a few years of college all together and it was in Canada um, and I went from like the hundreds of people who apply all the way to interviews like the 14 people they would select three and Congrats. yeah that was great but then I didn't get it so <sighs> I stayed in Costa Rica <laughs> um, so that could have been like my story would have been so different of course but I feel like for people who are especially in in small countries I know I know this may sound very privileged to many people because it's not that easy, right? Especially coming to the United States where education is expensive. I didn't take any loans and I was fortunate that my mom got a good job that could cover a lot of it and I got all the scholarships I could. I mean, there was hustle, there was prayer and <laughs> there was all, all the in-between and an opportunity and just like great connections that can help out. But um, like just connections, I call it like just friends that introduced me to things that introduced me to opportunities. But I feel like if you have the possibility to get out of your country and go to another country or go to Europe, like even, um, and study there, just the fact that you're surrounded by other people will expand your world so much. And it doesn't matter what you study, just like being in a different environment will break your bubble and um, open opportunities. So I will tell myself that, like, just get out, do the thing you can. You can do it and it's going to be great. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's the more different groups of people that are outside your bubble that you expose yourself to, your bubble automatically gets bigger and you just grow with it. So that's a really good tip. And last mm -hmm. question, imagine yourself five years from now. 
you will have met Christo by now. <laughs> you will, uh, your son will be 10. Um, Dang. You will probably have spoken at a conference, hopefully. Yeah. What do you think your future self would tell you today? Hmm. I, I honestly think my future self would just tell me, hey, just, just keep at it. Like, don't, don't quit, you know. Just keep going, do your best, and remember what's, what's important. I think that's it. I, I hope my future self will, will say, climate change is already solved, and politics is not an issue anymore, and AI just decided to go to another planet and leave <laughs> us alone. <laughs> I hope, but, you know, I feel like in myself, he'll just tell, oh, like my future self would just tell me, hey, just skip at it. It's all worth it. Nice. Well, yeah. thank you so much. If anyone of the listeners want to learn more about you, where can they find you? To hire me as a graphic recorder, we have an event. Uh, you happen to know people who organize conferences or who has like internal meetings, uh, with people who are doing strategy in big corporations and stuff like that. That's my stuff. And my website is www.alejoporrasart. That's A-L-E-J-O-P-O-R-R-A-S. ART.com and they can find all the information there. I'm also on Instagram, on LinkedIn. I believe there's probably links in this podcast where you can uh, access directly to that. So you can text me there uh, or you can send me an email at Alejo Porras Art, Alejo Porras ART at gmail.com and um, I'll give you more information there to book a call. Yeah, my website. Um, way to connect as a friend as a fellow creative on instagram as a professional like if you're looking for you know hire me or collaborating or anything on linkedin i say that instagram is my neighborhood linkedin is downtown where i go to work so i treat those in very specific ways um dm me all you want on instagram uh on linkedin just follow me because if i don't know you i will not accept your invitation <laughs> so <laughs> that's just how it is um but yeah happy to meet people and if anybody has any questions about my journey, catch up on Instagram and let's chat. Nice. Thank you so much. And I'll leave all of the links in the description. And yeah, enjoy meeting Chris. <laughs> <And have a laughs> Thank good day. you. Yeah, you too. It was so interesting listening to Alejo's freelance journey. And I'm so excited for him that he can meet Chris in real life. I'm adding all the links about Alejo in the description of his podcast. Definitely give him a follow on Instagram. You'll learn a lot through his sketch notes. I really hope that after listening to this episode, as cheesy as it may sound, you'll realize that all of us have a little backpack full of gifts that we can share with anyone we meet. And sometimes we're having the pleasure of someone sharing a gift with us, like today, Alejo sharing his story with us. If you feel like the Freelance Blueprint has been in any form a gift for you from my little backpack, I'd love for you to leave a review and hit the follow button. And thank you so much for listening to this episode. You can also support the Freelance Blueprint by sharing it with your friends. That's all from me, and I can't wait to have you join again next week. Bye!